All right. Well, welcome to the, um, the TCE Roundtable. This is September 25th, 2019, and we're glad everyone could join us. Um, we've done some introductions, and I just kind of want to go over what today's program will look like. First, we're going to hear from Tony Krasnick of US EPA. He also joined us last summer. Uh, he is an expert in uh, Toxic Substance Control Act, specifically as it relates to TCE and what's happening um, with the risk assessment and, and with the uh, uh, rule writing portion um, of uh, TCE under the, um, the Toxic Substance Control Act or the TOS or TOSCA, as many people know it. Then we're going to have Randy Carlson from KDHE. Uh, Randy is uh, with the Bureau of Environmental Remediation and he's going to talk about the um, overall impacts that TCEs had in our states. And our featured speaker today is Richard Starkey um, from um, Safe Kim in Europe. And we really appreciate Richard uh, joining us um, from Prague this morning. And then I hope to have someone from the International Aerospace Environmental Group uh, join us and provide us with a brief update. Uh, they weren't quite sure if they could do that. And then after that, we will do discussions. So this webinar is being um, recorded or roundtable is being recorded or at least portions thereof. Um, and so as most of you know, just a little background on TCE, why are we focused on trichloroethylene? Um, it is a carcinogen to humans through all routes of exposure. And you can see some of the other things um, there, re the properties there. Uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's halogenated. Uh, it's a universal degreaser, so it's a wonderful degreaser. Um, and uh, fortunately, um, microorganisms can break it down. Uh, but physical and chemical characteristics, uh, it is, um, uh, you can see the boiling point and the vapor pressure there, so it is a VOC. It, it's a hazardous air pollutant. Uh, we know that um, there are some strict air quality standards. In fact, a, a, a MAC standard or a NESHAP, a national emission um, a standard for hazardous air pollutant that go with the use of um, TCE in aerospace. And we do know that if uh, companies are able to eliminate aero, um, TCE, they will be able to get out of the once in, always in, will not apply. They will be able to get out of that uh, niche app. So uh, that's an important regulatory caveat that's really just come about in the last couple of years, but certainly a regulatory incentive. Um, moderately water soluble and, and denser than water, which creates some problems. So I, I wanna move right into our featured speakers. And um, again, bear with me for a minute while we change our, uh, our slides here. I'll stop sharing for a second and then I'll get Tony's um, presentation up. But um, Tony Krasnick is from the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics. He is with the, um, the US EPA. And, um, and I'm going to let make sure Tony is unmuted. Tony, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Well, we can hear you. So I just want to explain that Tony is a chemist and he's currently coordinates activities under Section 8E of uh, TOSCA and risk management activities um, specifically related to um, a trichloroethylene and uh, perfluorinated uh, chemicals or those PFOFs, right, under TOSCA. So, um, uh, Tony has a master's in analytical chemistry from St. John's University and a master's in business. Um, he worked for the International Business um, from um, Zinken School of Business prior to joining EPA. And um, let's see, Tony was an international business consultant and taught general chemistry and environmental chemistry at various colleges, including George Washington University. So, uh, Tony, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pull your presentation up. So, if you want to get started at any point, go ahead. 
Okay, great, thanks. Can you see the first slide? We're getting there. I have a little bit of a, um, oh, can you put it in presenter view? Yes. I think that works. All right. Oh, and Tony, you were gonna, did, are you ready to share your slides or did you want me to share them? I, I thought I did share them. You, you okay. Don't, you don't see them? Just a second. Okay. This is, um, okay. the, we have a different setup today than in the past and I don't I, think I it's that. working. <laughs> Are you able to stop sharing me? I, I think he's already sharing. Okay, great. I think you just need to go to your Zoom view. There we go. That be what's up. All right. Screen. Can I try something different? That's right. That's what I had to do. I knew what I needed to okay. do. I just had to get there. Okay, Tony, we can see your screens. Uh, okay. Is is it just a one initial slide? Yes, it's your intro slide. You should yes. be able to Okay. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Nancy, and thanks for everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the TC Roundtable. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, Dr. Stan Barone was going to join me. He's from our risk assessment division, but he had another event that he had to go to, so I'm uh, sorry he couldn't make it. So I'll begin uh, with just a brief overview of, of today's talk, and I'll provide a brief uh, summary of the Lorenberg Act, um, and then talk about the existing uh, chemicals and the uh, risk evaluation process of those existing chemicals, uh, provide an initial list of, it, of the 10 chemicals that underwent or are or undergoing the risk evaluation, and then get into the TCE and the risk evaluation of TCE. Uh, for those of you who had joined us uh, for the second round table, uh, most of this is repeat information, so sorry about that. Uh, and then uh, for any uh, new participants on, on this latest TCE round table, I hope you find this information uh, useful. So the Lorenberg Act, uh, was signed by the president going into immediate effect on June 22nd, 2016. And it amends and updates the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA. It was passed by large bipartisan margins in the U.S. House and anon anonymously in Senate. And it received support from chemical industry and downstream users of chemicals, NGOs, and other stakeholders. One of the key provisions of Lorenberg Act uh, is the risk evaluation of existing chemicals and the risk management of existing chemicals when risk evaluations uh, determine that there's unreasonable risk for those chemicals and for the specific conditions of use. So this diagram uh, presents the big picture of the risk evaluation process. So uh, we started with the initial list or set of 10 chemicals that were uh, chosen from the EPA TSCA work plan. And then uh, the second set of high priority chemicals, a second set of 20 chemicals was just announced on August 23rd, 2019. Uh, comments on, uh, the, on, on the draft um, prioritization of those 20 chemicals are due by November 21st, 2019. The next phase after prioritization is the actual risk evaluation, and that takes anywhere from three to three and a half years. So in risk evaluation phase, currently we have 10 chemicals, and one of them is TCE. Once the risk evaluation is completed for TCE, there will be determinations specific to conditions of use on whether uh, those chemicals present an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment, or they don't present an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment. If they do present an unreasonable risk to human health and environment, there's a next stage, which is the risk management of those chemicals 
to address any unreasonable risks that EPA determines through the risk evaluation process. The risk management typically takes anywhere from two to four years to complete. So through risk evaluations, EPA determines if a chemical substance presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health of the environment under the conditions of use, and it does so without considering cost or other non-risk factors. We also consider unreasonable risks to potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations. As I had mentioned before, this process takes three to three and a half years. For each risk evaluation that's completed, EPA must designate a new high priority chemical substance. So by December of 2019, EPA must designate at least 20 chemical substances high priority for risk evaluation and 20 chemical substances as low priority. As I mentioned before, we released the list of the 20 chemical designated as high priority and the comments on those chemicals are due by November 21st of this year. And I'll have the link to the public docket at the end of the presentation. So here are the statutory requirements for the risk evaluation. So the first deliverable is the scope document, which is typically published within six months of initiations. And in the scope document, EPA must identify hazards, exposure, conditions of use, uh, and also include potentially exposed or so susceptible subpopulations. Following the scope document, uh, where we also identify the conditions of use, EPA has to complete a risk evaluation. The first phase is, or the first deliverable is the draft risk evaluation, which integrates all of the information, all the hazard and exposure information and, and the conditions of use on that particular chemical, and then also assesses the risk from that chemical for those specific conditions of use. There's a publication in Federal Register, and there's at least a 30-day public comment period. Um, EPA is expected to release the draft risk evaluation of TCE by end of this year. Following the release of the draft risk evaluation, there's a public comment period, and then EPA finalizes the risk evaluation, which is also published in the Federal Register. And EPA expects to publish the final risk evaluation by June of next year. So here's a list of the initial 10 chemical substances that EPA had identified for the risk evaluation. Uh, the statute requires EPA to uh, select 10, 10 chemicals from the 24, for 2014 update to Tusca work plan. Uh, and you see that one of those chemicals is TCE. Nancy already touched on a kind of overview of TCE. Uh, so TCE is a volatile organic compound, it's a hazardous air pollutant, and it's, a, it's classified as a human carcinogen. It's wise, widely used in industrial and commercial processes, and there are also some uses in consumer products. According to CDR, more than 255 million pounds uh, of TCE were used per year. Majority of TCE is used as a intermediate in manufacturing refrigerant chemicals, and then much of the remaining uses are as a solvent for metal degreasing. The smallest percentage or about 1% is used in other applications, including dry cleaning and consumer uses. Here are some examples of industrial and commercial uses. Uh, TC is used um, in uh, processing as a reactant for other chemicals, uh, degreaser cleaner, for example, in vapor degreasing, cold cleaning, aerosol degreasing, it's used as an intermediate and refrigerant manufacture. It's used in adhesive sealants, paints, and coatings, spot cleaning and dry cleaning facilities, and also various other uses. The consumer uses include degreaser, cleaner use, lubricant, spot remover, carpet cleaner, and many other uses. So the work on TCE or the assessment of TCE began before the Lorenberg Act uh, more specifically, in 2014, uh, EPA conducted a risk assessment, and in that risk assessment identified uh, risks from uh, 
a number of uses, including the risk from using TCE as an aerosol, using TCE as a spot cleaning and dry cleaning facilities, and then also using uh, TCE in vapor degreasing. Uh, EPA is re-evaluating those uses in the current risk evaluation that's ongoing. In June 2018, uh, we pub published the TCE problem formulation, which refines the scope and the conditions of use that are considered in the risk evaluation and uh, explains how EPA uh, is expected to evaluate those conditions of use. The current risk evaluation focuses on the exposure pathways associated with TSCA uses that are not subject to existing regulatory programs and associated processes carried out under other EPA administered statutes because those pathways are likely to present the greatest areas of concern. Uh, in the risk evaluation, EPA will determine if a chemical substance presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment under the conditions of use. And each draft risk evaluation will be peer reviewed by the Science Advisory Committee on Chemical or the SAC. Uh, we had a number of those already, a uh, number of those already ha happened and uh, there will be one on TCE once the draft risk evaluation is published. There will also be a 30-day public comment period. And as I mentioned before, EPA expects to publish the draft risk evaluation by December of this year. And then that follows a public comment period, which then is followed by the SAC review. And then finally, there'll be a final uh, risk evaluation released in by June of, of next year. If EPA finds unreasonable risks related to the use of TC for the conditions of use that it identified, then EPA is required to undergo risk management activities on those conditions of use to address the unreasonable risk that it identifies. So TASCA Section 6A of TASCA provides EPA with the authority to prohibit or limit the manufacture, the processing, the distribution in commerce, use or disposal of chemical substance or mixture. So if EPA through the risk evaluation identifies unreasonable risks, then it uses the authority under TASCA section 6A uh, to address those risks to the extent necessary. Here are all the options that EPA has under TASCA section 6A. Um, so to address the unreasonable risks, EPA could prohibit or otherwise restrict manufacture, processing, or distribution in commerce. EPA could prohibit or otherwise restrict for particular use or above a set concentration. EPA could require minimum warnings and instructions. EPA could require record keeping or testing. EPA could prohibit or regulate manner or method of commercial use. EPA could prohibit or regulate manner or method of disposal. And then EPA could direct manufacturers' processes to give notice of risks to distributors and users and replace or repurchase. EPA could also use a number of these options together to address the unreasonable risk. So there are a lot of options on the TSCA Section 6A that EPA could use to address the unreasonable risks that it identifies through risk evaluation. Um, just want to highlight that dialogue, such as the TC roundtable and other engagements that EPA has with the stakeholders, all play a role in our risk evaluations, in our identific identifications of conditions of use, of um, getting data on use and exposure, and then also informing uh, any risk management activities in the future if EPA identifies unreasonable risks in the conditions of use of TCE. So once we release the draft risk evaluations, that provides another opportunity for the students to provide comments on the risk evaluation of TCE.
Here's a summary of the key dates. So problem formulation was published on June 1st, 2018. And that's the document uh, with the scope of the risk evaluation and also lists all the conditions of use uh, that the EPA uh, will evaluate in the risk evaluation. Then the draft risk evaluations will be published by December 2019. There'll be at least a 30 day public comment period on the draft risk evaluation and they will all be peer reviewed. Uh, following the peer review, EPA uh, will finalize the risk evaluation and publish them by June of 2020. And if there are unreasonable risks identified in the risk evaluations, uh, that's when EPA begins risk management activities. So there will be a draft proposed rule uh, on TCE within a year, and then a final uh, rule on TCE a year after the draft rule gets published. And this last slide just has some additional resources. It has a link to the problem formulation document. It has a link to uh, the web pages on risk evaluation of TCE and risk management of TCE. And then also has the links to the dockets, uh, both for the old risk assessment uh, the new risk evaluation, and then also links to the proposed rulemakings that we had done back in 2016 on spot cleaning in dry cleaning facilities, the TCE and aerosol degreasing, and the proposed rule on TCE and on vapor degreasing. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I do have one, Tony. Uh, last year in June when we hosted our TCE roundtable, uh, that was the comment period. And I was curious if you got, uh, what kind of comments you got or if there, there were ones that were very common. Um, can you share any of that? I know that's all out there on the web. We can read the comments still, right? Yeah, so all those comments are still in the, in the public docket um, on that last slide. Um, so, so the last comment period was on the problem formulation. And uh, there were some comments on uh, the conditions of use. And um, well, we, we had uh, comments on whether we had identified uh, the appropriate conditions of use with it was, uh, I don't think we added any new conditions of use. I, I think we had captured them all in the problem formulation. Um, but that comment period was, uh, was, was kind of focused on identifying the conditions of use. And I don't think we had made any edits as a result. There was additional information that was provided on specific to those conditions of use that EPA had has used in the risk evaluation. But there were no... Uh, additions or deletions in in response to um, um, to the addition in the initial conditions we used that we had identified. Okay, great. Any any questions online or um, looks like we've got one chat here, maybe one new one. I was just telling. Oh, people. okay, great. They're posting chat. All right. If there's no questions, then. Um, uh, Tony, I'll have you just uh, stop sharing your screen. And Tony, we appreciate uh, your time and your expertise. You're, you've always been so willing to assist us and uh, you are welcome to stay on as long as you can. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks to everyone for having me at the TCU Roundtable. Thank you. Okay, well, next up we've got Randy Carlson from KDHE. And Randy, do you want to share your screen or do you want us to manipulate your PowerPoint? Okay, uh, I'll try and share it uh, or manipulate it myself. Okay, great. I know you practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you hear me okay? We can hear you just great. 
And if you want to pull up your first slide, I'll just introduce you a little bit. You just have to share your screen. Okay. Let's see. Perfect. That's perfect. You've got it. Okay. So, uh, so you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your slide. And, um, and I'll just go ahead and introduce you, um, Randy. Um, Randy has actually been at KDHE for 26 years, working in various um, programs. Uh, he has a BS in geology from K-State, an MS in geology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Boy, I bet that was awesome to be up there. And then he's got his PhD, you guys. And uh, so it's Dr. Randy Carlson uh, from the University of Kansas. He's a licensed professional geologist. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us, Randy. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here, Nancy. Um, let's see if, uh, so I've got the, uh, just this opening slide here. Of, uh, and I'm just gonna talk in, in real general terms about uh, TC contamination in, in Kansas groundwater. Um, so TC it is a significant uh, contaminant that we see on a regular basis uh, in our investigations of uh, contaminated sites. Um, we've identified 298 sites with TC contamination and this is, we have a database that I pulled this information from so um, it's like all databases, it's, it's probably not exact, but in general. Um, so it's about 8% of, of all of our contaminated sites, and, but not including petroleum storage tanks because that kind of dwarfs everything because uh, there's so many of those, um, as you're probably aware. Um, it, I was uh, looking through our database at the uh, sites that are manufacturing facilities uh, and which ones of you know which ones have TC contamination there were 88 of uh, those sites 30% uh, of our TC contamination inventory so all the sites that have TCE um, contamination in, in groundwater um, so you know what you can kind of draw from that is where there's manufacturing we've we commonly find TC contamination in, in the groundwater, and that's you know that's from historical use, uh, predominantly. I, um, uh, you know, most facilities that we uh, work with today, you know, take a lot better uh, maintenance of their uh, of their uh, chemicals than maybe in the past. So I was just going to show a few uh, examples of uh, our most, more prominent sites where we have uh, TC contamination. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, on the right is a, a map of the uh, North Industrial Corridor in Wichita, uh, or the NIC, as we like to call it. Um, TCE is the most common contaminant uh, in groundwater there, there. and the, the map here on the right shows uh, just uh, the overall plumes that are uh, coming from various, a variety of sources. Um, and uh, I know you can't read the, the legend there, but the, uh, the red lines are uh, concentrations of more than 200 micrograms per liter. The orange are 100 to 200 and, and so on down the line. So blue is, is less than five, kind of the outline. Um, and this corresponds to, you know, where all the, a lot of the major industries in Wichita are located. Um, and uh, I just have a, a few notes on the uh, remediation approaches that have been taken uh, uh, at this site. It's been around quite a while and uh, it's got pump and treat for groundwater. Uh, um, and it's done a lot of uh, air sparge and, and soil vapor extraction at the source areas. And that's, that's predominantly because uh, it's a really good aquifer right here through, uh, through the heart of Wichita. And uh, so you can move a lot of air through it and, uh, and through the uh, Beto Stone. And uh, so those are 
air sparge and SBE kind of uh, traditional uh, remediation approaches for uh, this kind of a geologic situation. Um, so we, uh, I have a couple more slides of which of Wichita can, uh, TC contamination, but you know it's our largest manufacturing uh, area in the state, um, and uh, so we see TC contamination in, in the industrial areas, such as Nick, where I just showed you the map. Uh, another example is the the Boeing facility, which is now Spirit uh, in southern Wichita, and then it, we've got this. You know why there's so much attention there is we've got a really good aquifer that uh, we've been trying to uh, protect and to clean up over the oh since the 90s uh, when a lot of this contamination was first found. Um, KDHT has expended a lot of resources, uh, and uh, the companies there have you know worked uh, worked with KDHE and the city of Wichita as well um, to uh, come up with various strategies of cleaning up the contamination. Um, so this is the, uh, the Boeing site uh, in southern Wichita. Um, and uh, this is pretty much uh, up to date map of what it, what it looks like now. Um, the, uh, there's a kind of a bullseye here of, of red that's over uh, 100,000 micrograms per liter. So it's uh, still got pretty high concentrations, but the map did used to be a lot larger. I mean, the contamination used to be a lot more widespread. Um, and uh, so TCE is the, the common contaminant here. Um, they Boeing has instituted a variety of uh, remedial actions or remedial techniques, and they've been a very proactive uh, uh, industry in uh, trying to do uh, lots of things to clean up the contamination uh, that's predominantly historical. They've done uh, pump and treat, uh, in situ bioremediation, plus uh, recirculating the water and, and then re-injecting it. Uh, they've got a couple of, uh, or a few, permeable reactive barriers that they uh, put in um, zero valent iron to uh, reduce the uh, TCE. Um, also done excavations wherever possible. Uh, that's always a good technique to get, a, uh, get your source areas under control. Um, and then they're all also, you know, have a very uh, extensive monitoring program uh, to uh, keep track of where everything is and see how they're, how they're doing and, and which techniques are working better than another. Um, one of the things you find in these, these big mega sites is uh, uh, people try lots of different approaches and then you see which, which ones work better. And, and then there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the subsurface. So what makes sense in one area, uh, you might use something else in another. Um, And uh, so where, where the Boeing facility sits, the, the Arkansas River and the really good aquifer is to the east, and you can see that's, or to the west, I'm sorry, to the west, and you can see that's where the, you got these uh, groundwater flow directions. These big pink uh, arrows here are showing that uh, everything's moving to the west towards the Ar Arkansas River and, uh, and the really good aquifer that's associated with it. So, uh, you know, when we find TC contamination, uh, do we always think it's from a, a manufacturing facility? And uh, not, not necessarily. It's also uh, very common at military bases. Uh, and then there's the breakdown uh, of PCE uh, at dry cleaner sites. Um, and then there's a variety of uh, other sites such as landfills, uh, maintenance shops, etc. Um, but, 
but a really big thing is is the dry cleaning sites that that uh, I'm just looking at our database uh, and for all the TCE sites um, there's TCE at all the dry cleaning sites because under reducing conditions in the aquifer the PCE uh, breaks down into T TCE uh, and then it goes on into 1,2-DCE and, and then uh, vinyl chloride at the end and before it goes into ethene. Uh, and uh, so, so we, uh, you know, spend a lot of time uh, looking at, at all these various uh, parts of the, of the TCE chemical breakdown. Um, so uh, one, one of the things I take away from this is that TC contaminant sources, they may not be the greatest in number uh, because there's all these other things out there, uh, but uh, they're, a, they're a dominant contaminant at many sites and many of our larger sites. So sitting just to the, uh, to the east of the Boeing site is um, McConnell Air Force Base. And uh, they have a, a lot of TCE uh, contamination in the groundwater there from uh, just from maintenance, I guess. Uh, there's uh, over on the uh, west side of the, of the uh, runways, uh, they're showing us a, a source area there. And I think if you went back, let's see, if we go back to that Boeing site, over, over on the uh, east side, this is the plume that comes uh, on the McConnell picture. It was just showed as a big orange blob up, up here. Um, but uh, they've done a lot more work on it uh, since that other slide was made and uh, showing the extent of the plume uh, coming onto a good portion of the Boeing property. And uh, so that's, that's this orange blob here. Um, but there's a lot of smaller smaller areas uh, uh, where there's TC contamination that's been released from the hangars along the flight line here. Um, and then there's also some uh, TC contamination down in the um, southeast portion of the base uh, where they have uh, fire training areas and maybe some chemical storage sites. Uh, as well. So this is, you know, this is a very large, large area. Plumes are, are a little bigger than, than they look on the map. Um, you know, they've tried a variety of things uh, for remediation at McConnell. They're, they've been doing some pneumatic fracturing and then injections uh, of various compounds. Either they're trying to do some bioremediation or injecting chemicals that will cause oxidation, such as permanganate, or reduction, um, such as uh, zero valent iron. Uh, another example is, uh, of a mil former military base is the uh, Schilling Air Force Base in Salina. Um, again, they, they have a lot of TC contamination. The, uh, these uh, blue uh, outlines here, um, those are various plumes that I've been identified. Uh, they're kind of separate from each other, but they might have some common source areas or more than one source area within them. Um, and uh, I think these, the, these are like the edge of the plumes. So it's either, you know, below, you know, less than five micrograms per liter. Um, there's a lot of detail in this map if you get into the, the weeds with it, um, showing uh, different remediation uh, that's going to be uh, tried there. This, uh, the cleanup at this site is just, it's in the planning stages right now. We've just done the corrective action decision, uh, was published earlier this year, and uh, specifies a number of approaches uh, to address the contamination at the site. Um, it's, it's over a large area, so you have a different geology and different areas. And so there's um, 
other, some technologies may work better than others. So uh, there's some soil excavation planned uh, to address some source areas. Uh, there's some pump and treat along with a re recirculation in, in uh, I believe up in this northern uh, area. Uh, there's some thermal conductive heating that's uh, going to be tried to apply, try to apply that technology also by remediation and then uh, permeable reactive barriers using zero valent iron again. And then uh, lots of uh, attention paid to monitoring the, the plumes and seeing um, what natural attenuation uh, might, might help out. Then uh, land use controls. Really, land use controls are something in all of the, uh, the remedies uh, so that uh, we have a, what's called an environmental use program where um, we uh, impose uh, restrictions on future use of the property so that uh, they'll, for instance, in, at these sites there's usually restrictions on uh, residential development, on drilling water wells, uh, and, and things of that nature where where the existing contamination could, uh, in the future, not present a, a risk to uh, human health. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the last slide I've got. This this is the Gilbert and Mosley site in uh, Wichita. Uh, it's pretty well uh, south of Kellogg Boulevard. Um, and this shows the, the PCE uh, that's released from dry cleaning facilities. And there'll be TCE is a, a part of this contaminant mix, um, but it, it's all uh, mostly sourced uh, from dry cleaning facilities where there's uh, PCE as a predominant, is a, the beginning of the uh, chemical stream. And they're using a, that's a variety of, of uh, remedial technologies there. Uh, it's a site from you know, back in the 90s, so it's it's got pumpetry. Um, it does excavation, air sparge, SVE, because it's following that same uh, plume. We've got the, the Arkansas River here on the west side of, of uh, the site. And there's also uh, other sites on the uh, west of the uh, Arkansas as well. They're just not shown here. And thank you. So that's 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 what I have. Any questions for Randy? And one so hour. Yeah, just, I'll repeat it if you can't oh, hear it. Go ahead. Uh, maps you show me the online. Oh, I'd be curious about the same. Randy, the question is the the plume maps that you're showing um, today in your presentation are they available at your website as well? Um. I don't know if they are. Uh, the uh, the Schilling Air Force Base site. Uh, that's we've got the CAD and uh, some of the other documents. I think are still up uh, on a page dedicated to that. So I'm I'm sure that map is there because that's from that uh, one of the reports. Um, the Nick site that might it it depends. Uh, if those are available or, you know, some of them I took out of the site reports. Others are um, just kind of standalone maps that have been made. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure. If you um, want to look into it, Randy, and then just shoot me an email and I'll get it out to this group if they are available. Okay. Well, is this, uh, is my presentation going to be available on your website? It is. It is. Okay, I just so didn't know if some of your maps were more interactive, so you could actually zoom into them um, on your website or not. Uh -huh. um, Gilbert Mosley is of interest uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of a fun fact, yesterday I was at, at the Water Center for the RICRA training, and, um, and I, I talked to Charles Anderson down there. He's the one who who uh, maintains that site now from the city. And he said they just started laying the pipe for Nick. 
So they're going to start bringing in, they're, they're finishing up, I guess, or they have to tail end of the Gilbert Mosley, uh, you know, air stripping project, and they're just going to start pulling in the Nick uh, water. Oh, yeah. Through that same facility? Yes. I didn't well, realize Nick, I thought Nick was already piped there, but evidently not. Well, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the individual uh, companies have been doing pump and treat for years with their own, at, you know, at their uh, facility boundaries or, you know, at the source areas. Um, and then I think, you know, the old, um, on a bigger picture, um, the, uh, the city is, is putting in extraction wells that are going to contain the plume as a, as a whole. So that, yeah, and, and uh, so that, that'll be really good to, to put them in the, the same treatment facility as uh, has been used. Because they've got those uh, shallow tray uh, air strippers down there that uh, seem to work very well. Good. Okay. Thank you, Randy. We appreciate your, uh, your time and, and sharing this information today for our TCE roundtable. At this time, we're going to pause the recording. Just find my little bio here. Keep moving my things. But um, thanks again, everyone, for being with us. And Allison, you can start the recording if you have it already. And so next up is our, our um, featured speaker. And um, I want to introduce um, Mr. Richard Starkey, and Richard, I'm sorry if I didn't say your last name correctly, but Richard is with Safe Kim, and um, Safe Kim Europe, and he, um, Safe Kim is an experienced provider of solutions for safe and sustainable use um, of solvents for industrial parts cleaning, and they've got offices in Germany and China and a network of distributors. They serve over 5,000 customers worldwide. Um, Richard joined uh, Safe Kim in 2003 with a background in chemistry and solvent recovery. He started as a technical support before he moved to his current role as sales manager for the UK, Ireland, and uh, Scandinavia. Recently taking on an additional responsibility of industrial manager for the aviation sector. He's been involved um, over the years directly with many major prime and uh, supply chains on the topics of industrial parts cleaning, um, REACH, R-E-A-C-H, chemical leasing and solvent training. And we really appreciate um, Richard joining us today. He's actually joining us from the, um, the, I believe you are at the conference, the International Aerospace Environmental Group Conference in in Prague, is that right, Richard? That's right, Nancy, yeah. I'm live in Prague right now. <laughs> well, you're coming through just great. So thank you uh, for uh, suffering through some of our earlier technical issues, but it's now time to turn it over to you, Richard. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. And thanks uh, for the invitation today to, to yourself and to everybody involved with this roundtable discussion. Uh, much appreciated. So the uh, agenda for the presentation, just going through, uh, there'll be a very short introduction to who Safe Chem are. Uh, then moving on to very few slides, really just a basic background, I guess, in terms of what is industrial parts cleaning. Then a little bit about the REACH story, because I can hear from uh, what Tony was saying earlier on, there's, there's some similarities with Tusker and the way things seem to be progressing now in the US. And then I guess the real sort of major part of the presentation is about the different options and the experiences that we've seen over the last years uh, with regards to alternatives to TCE. Uh, finishing off on legislation, but probably not going too deep into that one either. And, and then we'll just finish with uh, one slide conclusion at the end. So who are Safe Chem? Uh, this is our mission statement. I guess we've all got one. We, we 
came up with this over 10 years ago, something uh, that we were all uh, expected to remember. So we wanted to keep it as short as possible. Uh, but yeah, we see ourselves as a service company. We're very interesting. We're not your run of the mill chemical supplier dealing with you know, millions and thousands of tons of, of products necessarily. So there's a, there's a specific reason for the capital T in the, uh, because we very much see ourselves as a service company, the way that volumes have dropped in Europe, particularly over years as demanded, uh, companies have demanded then a higher level of service from the suppliers and really looking at innovating the use of these chemicals in various sectors uh, and being able to introduce new products and services that ultimately sustain the ability to carry on using some of the products that we've been talking about. Uh, we touch on a, on a few sectors. The uh, Obviously, our prime focus is metal degreasing, but I heard as well the dry cleaning sector. That's something else we're also involved with, uh, in addition to a couple of other ad hoc uses for different types of solvents. So our network uh, involves the chemical producers Dow and Olin. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see that we were actually part of Dow for 25 years. We, we have Dow to thank for our existence. They set us up in 1992. Uh, but we work in with a, a service alliance of different distributors. So we don't physically make anything. We don't physically deliver anything. We're really orchestrating as a service business uh, all of these elements relating to providing a customer with an overall solution. So you can see probably some familiar names there as well with the likes of Univar and Brentag as distribution partners, working with institutes and associations, and you'll recognize probably the IAEG, uh, as we were just here to this week uh, for one of their face-to-face -face meetings. And then maybe not so familiar is the far right hand side, uh, which are our equipment partners. We have a very unique, uh, well-established non-commercial agreement with probably about 12 of Europe's leading manufacturers of closed technology. And we really see those guys as the experts in the equipment uh, and they hopefully see us as the experts in the chemistry and we have a very nice relationship where we approach customers together uh, to find overall solutions for them. So we haven't stood still over the last 27 years now since we were created by Dow. The, the driver was very much uh, legislation that was changing in the late 80s, early 90s in Germany. Uh, specifically prior to the VOC directive coming in. And uh, yeah, groundwater contamination as well was a big issue in Germany in the 70s and 80s. And I guess Dow came to a bit of a crossroads back in the early 90s. Did they basically decide to invest in these products that they were manufacturing and supplying or were they just willing to let legislation, I guess, take its course and probably see the product disappear altogether? Luckily, they chose uh, the former in the term of investment and uh, really things just progressed from there outside of Germany to the rest of Europe, then into Eastern Europe, into China, uh, into the US. Uh, and as you can see, the introduction of one of the products that we'll talk about today, uh, uh, the actual brand Dow Clean 1601, which is a, uh, a grade of modified alcohol has actually been in use for over 25 years uh, as an alternative to products like TCE. But I won't go through every single element on there because the presentation will be, uh, as you mentioned, Nancy, the presentation will be available anyway afterwards. Some nice recognitions that we received along the way uh, that are available as well. Uh, my favourite one is the uh, the WWF one, and that's not the Wrestling Federation. That's the one with the uh, the panda on the front. Uh, we were actually deemed one of the world's top 50 green game changers, which is fairly phenomenal when you think about our business is still very uh, linked to chlorinated solvents. So, uh, yeah, some really nice recognitions there, in particular the one in 2016 when our own industry recognized us within Europe for the uh, Responsible Care Award. 
So what is industrial parts cleaning? I don't really want to sort of teach everybody how to suck eggs. I guess it's uh, something that's fairly uh, simple in our minds. What is industrial cleaning? At the end of the day, we just want to remove something that's not wanted on the surface. And I suppose you could say, well, what is more simple than that at the end of the day? What's so complicated about removing something? And there must be thousands of alternatives that are capable of doing that. But actually what we've seen for many, many years is actually with specific industry requirements, uh, whether it be environmental compliance, uh, complex geometries, uh, high throughput, all of these things make it a very challenging uh, situation to try and find alternatives or choose the right solution for your specific process. So again, uh, it's pretty often you see that there's this magic box where operators might not fully understand the technology of what's involved. Uh, and all they really desire at the end of the day uh, is to press a button and at the end of the uh, cycle receive components that come out that are flawless, uh, that don't require any further rework or uh, scrap parts, etc. that they want a reliable cleaning process. Uh, and as automated as possible. And I guess the importance of cleaning is uh, just one example here, the FITS Atlas of coating defects. There are thousands of uh, these different coating defects with some uh, amazing names, if you ever get a chance to have a look at them. But the common denominator uh, in, in a lot of cases where coatings aren't uh, meeting the requirements is that the the fact that the cleaning wasn't done correctly or wasn't done in a specific way uh, and that the right cleaning results weren't achieved, which have led on to quality issues further down the line. And I guess, again, putting that into context with TCE, we've used it for so many years. We, we guaranteed, if you like, uh, the results that we get. And yeah, we like guarantees in the aviation sector. So a little bit on the REACH story, uh, I was involved with the team uh, that pulled together a, an authorization. I'm, apologies, I don't know how many people are aware of, uh, of REACH, but it was a piece of legislation that came into Europe uh, probably about 2010, 2011. Uh, and it was a piece of legislation that was predominantly health and safety, uh, but it had some environmental aspects to it as well. And it was ultimately a piece of legislation that was to replace 40, 45 other pieces of legislation. And it was really a, a huge rationalization of the chemical industry. It was the European Union basically saying, if you can use an alternative, a safer alternative, then you should. And there was a lot more pressure put on the manufacturers of the chemicals uh, because it wasn't just the chemical that was under scrutiny, it was also the use. And as we know, and as you've mentioned already, TCA has many uses, not just metal cleaning. So Safe, uh, Safe Chem and Dow at the time submitted an application. It was fairly groundbreaking because it was an application for authorization. TCE went through a chemical safety report and it was already deemed, if you like, uh, a chemical that required an authorization because of its risk phrases, because of it being a known carcinogen, et cetera. So it was sort of fast-tracked, if you like, along with a lot of other carcinogen, mutagen, reprotoxins. Uh, but we were the first company to actually apply for an authorization on behalf of our customer base, so on behalf of the downstream users. At the time, there were around uh, estimated 500 end users uh, using TCE, so the justification for the application was, was pretty high. So that was the name of the application that was submitted. And the people who uh, would benefit from that were people, uh, end users, who could apply all of the risk management measures as described in the chemical safety report that was issued. Uh, all of the conditions uh, had to be met. And yeah, basically, uh, there was an authorization recommendation from the European Chemical Agency of seven years uh, once uh, the consultancy part of it subsided. 
Uh, unfortunately, the uh, European Union went against the recommendation and only uh, granted four and a half years. So the situation we're in now as well in Europe is that uh, for the companies who have been still, still using TCE to this day, when the authorization went through, they had to demonstrate that there was no suitable alternative. And if they could demonstrate that there was no technically suitable alternative, then they would then need to make sure that they applied all of the risk management measures. Those included things like certain types of technology, certain types of training, uh, even chemical leasing was involved with the uh, authorization. Uh, and yet the, the, uh, the downstream unit user had to demonstrate that technically there was no viable alternative. This was uh, actually done with uh, an analysis of alternatives, which Dow completed, I think it was like 80, 90 pages, uh, specific to the use of TCE uh, for industrial parts cleaning. There were 19 uh, different use parameters described, ranging everything from uh, types of substrate, uh, different geometries, maybe heat sensitive parts, all the way through to approval processes. Uh, and the way that companies used that information was that, like you see in case A, uh, the alternatives that were considered, I think there was about nine or 10 of them, ranging from uh, all the chlorinated solvents, the brominated, the fluorinated, so all of the halogenated uh, options, in addition to aqueous, water-based systems, standard hydrocarbons, modified alcohol, so pretty much everything you could shake a stick at that was on the market available as an alternative. If you were able to demonstrate uh, that one of those alternatives was suitable, the law stated you had to switch. Now, again, the, the uh, excuse or the reasoning of financials, et cetera, was, yeah, it was heard, but it was a relatively uh, weak argument. If, however, in case B, that you recognized you had a number of these specific use parameters and against those alternatives, there was something that didn't give you those uh, uh, results that TCE gave you. So TCE being the benchmark, you not being able to switch to something that is going to affect you as a business, which could be from a technical quality point of view or even from an ongoing cost point of view, then you had a, uh, the argument was on, uh, the law was on your side to be able to carry on using TCE as long as it was in the right type of equipment. So where do we get to now in terms of the different options? And I guess this is where Safe Chem really comes into play with one-on-one uh, -on -one contact with our end users and people who are interested uh, in talking about that consultancy side of our business. Really to fully understand uh, the best solution, you have to take into account a lot of different things ranging from the type of parts and the type of contamination all the way through uh, the economic factors to the environmental health and safety considerations. So it's only when you actually take every single one of those points on uh, that we believe as a business that you come to the right decision. And some examples of that uh, in the next few slides here where if you've got uh, uh, certain types of, of metals where you have uh, mixed metals, maybe you've got yellow metals and aluminium and other things, you know that that's not always uh, easy, in fact, impossible sometimes to mix metals in a, in a straight water-based system uh, like aluminium and copper, for instance. Or you might have uh, different metals that require different levels of management of chemistry uh, in regards to pH. And then the size of components and the complexity of the components are also a major factor as well in terms of things like drying behavior, uh, the smaller the part, for instance, the more difficult it is to dry. Uh, a good example of that are the tiny little balls at the end of uh, Parker pens, you know, where there's like millions of them in one basket. Or even a, a, a seal, a uh, honeycomb sealing ring where there's 10,000 blind holes. You can't just stick that in a washing up bowl and uh, expect to get it to the same standards as what you require, particularly in the aviation sector. 
So the fundamentals are, are really, you know, it normally brings a smile to everyone's face. How do we clean the dishes at home? Uh, we normally get some interesting answers when we raise this, particularly when we use this slide with some of our uh, solvent training sessions that we do on end users uh, facilities. Uh, but the principles are actually the same. It's quite amazing. Uh, the successful cleaning results, there are all these different uh, factors relating to uh, time uh, that if you don't have the right temperature for instance again think about the washing up we're not washing up at home with cold water if we were then we'd probably be at the sink for a lot longer uh, or we need mechanics in terms of agitation uh, with the scouring pad for whatever it might be uh, and all of these things are relating to time at the end of the day and the chemistry is a really important point because ultimately there are only two avenues that you can go down. Uh, when we're doing the washing up again at home, we're adding washing up liquid. So we've got chemistry there. We're not relying just on water to remove those different types of contaminations. But with the chemistry, you've either got water or solvent. You know, there's, there's not many other uh, real methods that will give you the results that you need based on the type of parts that you're actually cleaning. And obviously with water, there are thousands of different options in terms of detergents, normally keeping the chemistry in a neutral alkali or acidic condition. And then with solvent, you have a relatively small group of different solvents to look at. And really choosing the right chemistry influences all of those things relating to time uh, and ultimately cost and energy and all of those things that you put into achieving the best results. So the solubility of choosing the right alternative kicks in. We know water and oil doesn't mix. So the big question is, after you've looked at the type of components that you're cleaning, the million dollar question is, what is it you're trying to remove? Uh, as I say, fairly obvious, water and oil doesn't mix. One repels the other. They're both different ends of the spectrum. So if you're trying to remove an oil or a wax or a resin, uh, then we use the terminology clean like with like because those components are not soluble in water. The same can be said, for instance, for things like carbon or salt. We know that those types of contaminants are not soluble in solvent. So why would you choose solvent to clean those uh, types of contamination off? And as you can see on this particular slide, standard hydrocarbons as a, an option for cleaning sits right at the far end and water sits right at the opposite end. And then we've got our chlorinated solvents, uh, much more non-polar. So again, why are they wonderful, as Nancy described, in terms of degreasing? Uh, well, yeah, they're a solvent. They're made from hydrocarbons. We're cleaning like with like. We're dissolving those contaminations off. Uh, so the, the physical properties that are unique to not just chlorinated solvents. I mean, you could argue all halogenated solvents are very desirable when it comes to industrial parts cleaning. The modified alcohols uh, that a lot of aviation companies now are starting to recognize uh, are, are interesting because they're a little bit more like a hybrid. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier on, I think it was Tony who said, uh, the water solubility of TCE is you know, virtually non-existent, less than 1%. Uh, with modified alcohols, it could be anything from 10% water solubility up to even higher. So you have a little bit of a hybrid situation where you are not just able to remove the uh, non-polar types of contaminants, but if you do have things like uh, minerals that are coming from water-soluble oils, if you're using town's water, for instance, if it's in a hard water area, then you probably have a much better chance as well of, of removing those types of contaminants. The other interesting thing is, is that there's technology available on the market now that's been innovated in recent years that actually has the ability to take a modified alcohol and water into the same process. So if you're a, a heat treatment company, for instance, subcontract where you're receiving parts from all over the place and you have no idea what's on the surface, you can actually deal uh, with all of these types of contaminants in one process and actually replace everything that you might have in, in that particular area.
So Safe Chem is really uh, supplying this information, consulting with a lot of other different companies, and we have a group of people internally dedicated to legislation, chemistry, uh, several doctors working for the business, supply chain, uh, sales, marketing, etc. But ultimately, we're supplying a risk management tool that, that really enables end users to profit from the best solution. So many times, the, the people that are reaching out to us are companies that have switched to an alternative. And, you know, the amount of times you hear that, oh, nothing's as good as TCE. We've been struggling for 10 years with the results that we get in. Uh, we've seen decisions being made, not on a technical level, and then companies suffer because of that. So what we're saying is, is that you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be TCE, it could be one of the other products that we supply, but everything has a risk to some degree, and what we're doing is providing the tools to manage that risk so you can carry on profiting from certain properties of this chemistry. Everybody probably remembers and uh, knows about the open top technology, open equipment, uh, very emissive, uh, emissions to atmosphere, whether it be fugitive or through the vents stack into the atmosphere outside, uh, typically supplied with 45 gallon, 200 litre drums. Uh, again, issues with brain contamination, you know, the lack of bonding or secondary containment and storage, etc., has always been a, an issue in the past. Uh, and historically, yeah, TCE, PERC, methylene chloride have been the, the substances, the chemicals that have been used and synonymous with open top vapor degreasing. And then in more recent years, brominated solvents, NPB, some of the fluorinated solvents have come on the market. And again, they tend to rely more on the open top type technology. Multi-tank aqueous systems, yeah, well again, you know, it's, it's very often that there will be a customer with solvent requirements and aqueous requirements. Uh, but if you're replacing a solvent system with an aqueous system, you're probably having multiple tanks, lots of water and heat, lots of energy uh, to dry the components. Issues there with carbon footprint, companies coming back to solvents because of the, uh, the amount of energy or the amount of water being used. Again, going back to our uh, washing up when the water's contaminated, what do we do with it? We pour it down the sink and start again. So, uh, you know, it's very, uh, very common as well to see uh, those systems as well being considered, but also looking at solvent, uh, back to solvent for a new solution. What we're talking about today in terms of uh, the main alternatives to TCE that we see are predominantly modified alcohols and perchloroethylene. So PCE as was mentioned earlier on, but not in the traditional sense, not used in the traditional way, used in totally closed systems which virtually elimit, uh, eliminate all of the, uh, the associated emissions. Uh, these things are typically uh, secondary contained, bunded, uh, safety systems that supply the chemical, et cetera. You will have carbon absorption systems that take the vents uh, emissions offline. So you can situate these te this technology anywhere you want in your facility, uh, and they're virtually fully automated. The handling system that we supply perk and modified alcohol in looks like that. Uh, it's literally a, a 45 gallon drum, uh, but with equipped with various connections. So the operator doesn't have to open the drum and that is directly connected to the machine. So if anything, as you can see from the outer container, that's not just acting as protection. It's also acting as a bun. So if anything fails on the drum, it's contained within the, the secondary container. The lid lifts up, the operator makes the connection a little bit like an airline and presses a button and transfers the chemical from point A to point B. And that's available for fresh and for waste because we, uh, we take responsibility for the waste product as well. So the safe tainer system, which I guess you could say is the bread and butter of our business, is the safe method of supplying products like PERC and modified alcohols to the customer. It's UN approved, it's best available technology. And again, the real driver for that particular method of delivery of product and use of product was ground contamination, going right back to the late 80s, early 90s. The equipment needs to be really fully understood. I don't want to drag on too much on this topic because I can send uh, yourself, Nancy, and the group 
uh, more information. But just think about it like your washing machine at home. Uh, you're bringing the work uh, into a chamber, you're shutting the door, and then you're bringing solvent that's held offline to the work. And you can literally have whatever you like going on in that chamber. You can have rotation, ultrasonics, immersion. You then typically uh, bring it into the chamber from a second cleaner tank of solvent. Uh, and then what you're doing then is creating vapor offline. So all of these things that you've been used to with the vapor degree, so you're doing, but in an automated sense, in a completely closed environment. And then again, typically you can be pulling a vacuum on the chamber for drying and then the parts come out. I think this technology is already uh, seen in the US. It's already established, maybe not so much with modified alcohols, maybe it is not too sure right now. Uh, but again, predominantly PERC and modified alcohols that have been replacing uh, TCE in Europe for the last, uh, well, however many years. The other huge benefit of this type of technology is the resource efficiency, because with the distillation properties of the chemical, you can just keep on recycling it. So from a circular economy perspective, the results are just phenomenal. Uh, with PERC and with Dow Clean, uh, you can typically have a process that would use less than 45 gallons per year, uh, even some of for the biggest machines, uh, 90 gallons a year, just to literally top up uh, with the very, very small losses that are associated with the process. So the resource efficiency, the energy efficiency, uh, is just unbelievable really, but I'll, I can give more information on that further down the line. The one important thing to remember with modified alcohol though, it's a, a real benefit for PERC because PERC as we know as TCE and, and the, some of the other halogenates are non-flammable. Uh, so we have a, a product being used in a closed system. Uh, PERC we see as a perfectly viable alternative uh, but if you want to move away completely from the halogenated solvents, uh, it's very difficult to find something that doesn't have a flash point. Uh, Dow Clean is no exception, but it's very, uh, you've got to really consider how you're using Dow Clean in the process. So the first point to remember, or the first point to make rather, is that Dow Clean 1601, which is the, the grade of product, uh, has a flash point of 145 degrees Fahrenheit, 63 degrees C. And we do not recommend and we do not supply that product into normal atmospheric technology. It's not for use in, in open top equipment. So many times we've seen different products coming on the market like NPB or some of the HFEs, etc., which you know guarantee compliance or promise uh, it's a drop-in alternative, a drop-in solution sorry, but we just don't believe there's such a thing as a drop-in solution with open technology. Uh, but with Dow Clean, you have to use it in a closed system anyway. Uh, the rule of thumb is that you can't go above uh, 15 degrees or 59 degrees Fahrenheit uh, below the boiling, boiling points, because at that point you create a vapor and then you have the mixture and you have the issue or, or a risk of an explosion. Uh, so you could ask, well, how on earth do you create a vapor in a, in a scenario that's safe? And again, the equipment manufacturers that we work with have been supplying this technology, developing it for the last 25 years, you know, and have thousands of machines globally. And what they do is they pull a vacuum of 100 millibar on the areas where you will go above uh, the flash point and you basically eliminate all oxygen. Uh, so you take all the oxygen out of the machine and uh, that risk of an explosion is uh, is completely eliminated and there's a lot of safety devices and valves, etc., all on, on this technology. Uh, but ultimately, for a modified alcohol process, you are still vapor degreasing, you still have ultrasonics, you still have immersion, all in a closed system. But the areas like the chamber and the distillation unit there's the ability uh, and the technology to eliminate all the oxygen out of there. Just the last couple of slides now, this is one of a, 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 a EU study. Uh, I think it was the European Union yeah, Commission. 
about 10 years ago, who did a study on uh, a number of different companies across Europe, analyzing uh, the effect from going from open machines to closed machines. Uh, it was based upon removing 100 kilograms of oil, uh, whether that be from one component or a basket of components. You know, some companies can introduce 100 kilograms of oil in a day. Some companies, it could be a year, whatever it might be. But yeah, the, the findings were quite staggering, really, where uh, I suppose you could say on average, they found that you needed 745 kilos of solvent to remove that 100 kilos of oil when using an open machine. And that was predominantly because of the emissions to atmosphere and a, and a lot of the solvent disappearing in the waste as well. Uh, when legislation kicked in and companies moved to closed equipment, you can see the effect that had because the machine isn't just a cleaning machine, it's a, a little mini chemical distillation plant. So you're constantly reusing the chemical. So it had a drastic effect. And then when you added chemical product services, uh, like what SafeChem have developed over many years, such as test kits, stabilizer concentrate, uh, solvent analysis lab services, where you then have the ability to optimize the process even further, the numbers are just, uh, yeah, unbelievable really, quite staggering. And uh, you can actually go even further now with chemical leasing uh, to as low as four kilograms to remove still the same amount of contamination. Just finishing off on legislation, I think all we can say is obviously there's a, there's a lot of it. Uh, it keeps us busy. Uh, listening to Tony earlier on, yeah, we, we've uh, acknowledged that things have been moving forward on this topic in the US. Uh, and we'd, again, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, again, speak to people in the US about our experiences in, uh, in, in Europe and how we can sort of bring those to end users. Uh, it was interesting to see that the latest 20 substance list included a very interesting molecule called transdichloroethylene, which obviously the name gives it away. It's a chlorinated hydrocarbon. So the issues is again of getting it into the ground. We've already seen some big aviation companies decide to move away from some of the fluorinated solvents that rely on that substance for the cleaning aspect uh, to things like Dow Clean because of it being a non halogenated solvent. Uh, the perk topic, certainly in Europe for us, has uh, been sort of dealt with to some degree. Uh, we have something called the CORAP decision, the Community Role in Action Plan, because there's thousands and thousands of tons, millions of tons even, of perk produced for different applications. But it went through a European study uh, and no further regulations were required. Other things going on with HFEs, we've seen NPB. So yeah, I guess the conclusion is, is that nothing is without some form of legislation. I'd like to thank everybody for the time today, for listening to me uh, rattle on uh, in my uh, Birmingham tones, uh, for anyone familiar with the UK. Uh, we've got, uh, as a conclusion, uh, some very nice case studies uh, that we've, not just recently done over many years with the likes of Leonardo, which is the most recent one, HS Marston and Collins, uh, where Dow Clean 1601 was provided as a solution and Dow Per MC as our grade of perk was su supplied as a solution. Uh, but ultimately, guys, I think the bottom line is this, you know, at the end of the day, we don't ever, we don't ever want to recommend something that's not gonna work. Uh, we rely upon the science and the technical aspects to find what is the right solution for a company uh, and not just try and find a quick fix uh, because we've seen time and time again, particularly in the UK as well, where that quick fix has been marketed and then the company is still in the same boat three or four years down the line. So uh, thanks again to everyone. And if anyone's got any questions, uh, happy to uh, happy to answer them. If you've got questions online, you can chat them in or raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, any questions from people in the room? Just 
And um, Richard, any anything more you you want to say on things that are being tested, or what you're presenting on at the um, the International Aviation Work Group? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been working with the IAEG now for a couple of years. Uh, with the face-to-face -face meetings, we were members for a few years before that. I mean, again, the topic is uh, to some degree deemed in Europe to have been dealt with, but we do see so you know every week issues within the supply chain, particularly of companies not uh, achieving the best results they can, or or even worse still, you know, just you know high percentages of uh, of reject work, etc. Uh, the validation side of it is a very important part. Uh, we, we've already got uh, official Dow Clean 1601 approvals with the likes of uh, Rolls-Royce uh, with Honeywell. Uh, there's one just about to come out through uh, GE. Uh, uh, we've got things going on right now with uh, Boeing and Airbus. So, you know, everybody seems to be looking at the modified alcohol route as an option to move away from all of the halogenated solvents if possible, but not necessarily go to the other extreme, which technically might not be suitable if that, if that is the case in, in, in the case of water. So, uh, but yeah, the IAG have been very supportive and I think the, uh, the working group that they're looking to pull together as well, specific to TCE replacement, we would be involved with and there's probably a lot of people that have already got membership of the IAEG that could get involved on that side of things. I mean, the other thing to mention as well is that SafeChem uh, were, were on the ground in the US a number of years ago, as you know, Nancy. Uh, that changed because of the, the Dow situation, uh, but we just literally right now uh, in, uh, in the process of confirming who our distribution partners will be and uh, definitely see ourselves as up and running in 2020 on the ground in the US as safe can. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you so much, Richard, for joining us. You did a, a great job. I appreciate uh, you providing these resources and, and the work that you're doing with aviation. Um, we don't have any questions online and there's no questions in the room. so. Um, while we make the transition, um, I'll have you stop sharing, Richard, and we'll go to um, we'll go to our next slide. And I don't believe our uh, the person I've invited to speak is on the line. So I'd actually invited. Oh, I, um, I think they are. Oh, are they? Great. Okay, Miss Zing. Shining Zing with Boeing, if you are on, if you can unmute yourself and we'll pull up your slide and then we're going to just talk a little bit about your website here. Oh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. And let's Alrighty, and I don't think that she is on. I'm not seeing her name there. Okay, so basically, um, has anyone ever been to one of those International Aviation Environmental Work Groups? I know they have the meeting every spring, their meetings in the US, and anybody ever been? I know you probably send representatives. Yes. Okay, Melissa has, okay, great. But um, um, their spring meeting, like I said, will be in the US, I'm not quite sure. I wanna say it might be in Vegas, but um, they're in Prague right now. 
and they do have a specific work group. Um, Boeing, um, Jennifer, uh, I can't remember her last name, spoke to us about two years ago when we first were introduced to this group. And you can go to their website too if you want to, Allison. And, um, and basically, uh, this group is working specifically on um, alternatives for TCE. There we go. Just a minute. Yeah, but I'm gonna need That's to what, yeah. stop sharing and reshare. And we have a little bit. Why is Zoom not coming up? That's interesting. But maybe what we'll do is um, I want to show you their website, but it this is where we we have a little bit of a display issue. Nope. That's okay. Why don't we just go back to the presentation? You can go to the next slide. So we do not want to end the meeting. Yeah, I just hit cancel. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to, there you go. I think you have to do manipulate it on this. This is where I was having the, the trouble. We don't want to leave the meeting. There we go. Okay. Um, and I, we have a video here. But um, there's a couple of problems with this. I went in and kind of did a little QA on it, and having worked in, uh, with regulatory stuff for um, some 20 years, I'm like, mm, that headline is a bit deceiving. Um, so uh, this, this um, was a drop-in replacement. It actually was just, this was just published like in June of 2019, and I reached out to uh, it was done through the Indiana Pollution Prevention Program, uh, and they have an intern program just like we do here in Kansas. And I reached out to, um, to their program and got in contact with the owners uh, to ask them um, to get some feedback from them on, you know, now that they've been using it for a few months, is it still working for them? But basically, that, that this comes from uh, Production Magazine, and, um, and so it wasn't published by the state necessarily, but it is a, a vapor degreasing process. They have these small parts that they, they are aerospace manufacturer, and um, they used a drop-in replacement for their uh, closed loop system. And um, it says it eliminates hazardous waste. That is not true. Uh, it eliminates a hazardous air pollutant. Um, so that headline is wrong. And in looking into it a little bit further, it still is a halogenated solvent, and it is a, um, it, it, it's a fluorine compound, basically. So has anyone used that fluorine or tried it? Uh, and so we, we basically eliminate that particular half, and we do have less of a, um, of a greenhouse gas impact, uh, and it does clean very well. It's non-corrosive and it won't stain the metal parts like some of the other uh, alternatives do, but it is still kind of that intermediary um, in that we're not able to get away from that halogenated solvent. The other thing to consider, Nancy, is uh, like I mentioned earlier on, a lot of those blends and grades of fluorinated chemistry, they rely heavily upon trans-DCE. Uh, Fluorine on its own isn't a very good cleaner. The solvency power of it is not very good. So they add trans-DCE into the product, uh, which is the chlorinated side, which does all of the degreasing. The KB value of that product is pretty high. Uh, but it's a very interesting molecule, trans-DCE, because it has a flash point of two degrees. So depending upon what brand and what grade of product you're using, uh, it can range from like 40% trans-dichloroethylene right up to like 90, 95% even trans-dichloroethylene, which obviously then really sort of introduces a, a higher risk from uh, something with a two degree flash point that you're boiling up to, in some cases, 40 degrees C. Uh, so there are some real considerations, particularly when you use it in a closed machine as well, because as you would imagine, with it being a, a chlorine, uh, it has the potential for thermal decomposition, and then that can produce acids, 
and none of the companies to our knowledge uh, state that you need to test the solvent for acidity uh, because most of the time those products are supplied in sort of fairly new open top ultrasonic type equipment, not, not really used in closed equipment. Uh, I'm not disputing it for one second that it's replaced the TCE, but I'm just waving a bit of a red flag to say if it goes into a closed machine and it's not monitored and you create acid, then you're not going to have a machine after very long. And we've yeah, seen that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Richard. Um, um, that's why I was a little skeptical of this. I do want to present, you know, um, the most recent things that are out there that we haven't presented in the past. And this was one of them. Yeah, everything else we found out there, we'd already shared with this group or it's already on our website. And it, it has the pros and cons, just like you know, Richard um, is explaining there. But we did have a question or a comment. I think he answered it. He answered it, corrosivity. Although the article says that it is non-corrosive, uh, it, it sounds like that is a potential problem. Okay, so um, there's some other discussion I wanted to have. There's some, there's some things I wanted to raise to uh, the attention of the aerospace audience. And for a minute now, um, this is going to move, um, this moves a little bit away from um, TCE. Uh, and into some of the TRI data, and then into the RECI data. So this was presented at the Kansas Environmental Conference. Uh, it was a RECI presentation that Gene Waters from the University of Omaha did. Was anyone in that uh, session? And this basically, um, this is just a screenshot, sorry for the, the visual here being kind of small, but it's a screenshot of the largest TCE users, um, the folks who um, report under TRI, and um, and then and you can see them there. Um, we've got you know Boeing, um, and we have uh, Globe, uh, and a few others there uh, listed. But what? I want it to get to just a little bit, and this is just in case you all are interested in exploring this a little bit more in the future. And by the future, I might mean uh, in 2020. Uh, not, in the, not in the near future, but you know, within the next 12 months or so. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about TRI data, what it means to health. Um, and are all the chemicals that are reported under TRI equally um, dangerous? Uh, how does the release or disposal methods affect exposure? Um, and then are people potentially exposed to these releases? So people in the workplace, people in the communities, uh, and how, how are people potentially exposed? So EPA uses this TRI data uh, along with some other data and they produce this tool, it's called a, it's a risk screening tool. And it's called uh, a risk screening environmental indicators or RECEs. RECE. And I thought it might be interesting to look at where we have what, what actual chemicals are released in the largest amounts that have actually the highest risks. So I'm just gonna give you guys a snapshot of this. I am not the expert on this. These slides come from uh, Jean Waters, our associate in Nebraska. She is much more of the expert on it, but she would, not, um, she would not call herself an expert necessarily. But she did put these all together. Um, and so this is information that's contained in TRI and it, it, it has details on quantities of chemicals released and managed through recycling, energy recovery, treatment. Um, and this is what the screening tool kind of looks like. Um, it, is a, it gives a score that is unitless, 
Um, and it models the relative risk to human health based on the size of the chemical release, the fate and the transport of the chemical um, that's being released, the size, the location of the community. And I'm just giving you a little snapshot here. But when we take a look at the RECI score, you can see that as, you know, just like anything, right? As we measure it, we start looking at how, how do we release it? Um, or how do we uh, reduce it, rather? And so you can see the trend has gone down. Um, and another point, I, when I showed that snapshot from, um, from the TRI, I should have pointed out something. For, I mentioned Boeing and I mentioned GLOW. And did you know that when you go to the TRI, you can search under a certain chemical for pollution prevention and you can look at the companies that have implemented pollution prevention to reduce that targeted chemical that you maybe are searching for. So I don't know if you know that, that TRI has all those tools, but that snapshot, what I should have pointed out, is that Globe and Boeing have both um, entered data indicating and entered techniques on the things that they've done to reduce just generally uh, their overall emissions. So in case you're interested in that, um, and uh, I'm sure you guys around the table are probably responsible for entering that data. And so understanding um, that. I believe those specifically do it actually refer to TCE reduction. Mm -hmm. So that was specific, but yeah. you could search for other pollution prevention uh, that's being done at um, aerospace. So you could search for industry. So just so you know how powerful that um, TRI uh, tool can be. But these are the RECI scores and the trends. And then what Jean did is she took, she looked at 2017 because of course that's the data that's available. And she took the top five facilities for the top five chemicals. And I wish you could see this a little better. I'm going to come up here. Um, but what we're seeing is this is trichloroethylene. And so you can see on the scale compared to some other things, co um, cobalt and cobalt uh, compounds. So at the very top, that biggest line that you're seeing there are going to be chromium and chromium compounds. And then next is ethylene oxide, which is actually contributed all to one facility. None of you. It's actually contributed to um, uh, hard uh, cross chemicals in Wyandotte County. Um, and so we're wondering, even taking a look at that, if that's, a, that's an error. Could be a, it could be an error on their part uh, for what they entered. So this is how important it is that the data you enter into TRIs, it's very important uh, that it is accurate. Um, but that top line, as I mentioned, is chromium, and you can see down below, it does list uh, the top facility, so the biggest contributor there on chromium is 3P, 3P processing. And then it goes out to kind of that magenta, which is coke, uh, and, um, and then out to uh, the peach, uh, and, and the other colors there, but the, most of those are all attributed to the Wichita area, all of that chromium. So looking at the entire state, the top five facilities, the top five chemicals, we can see where TCE is, we can see where chrome is. So though, that's what I'm kind of pointing out. Do we need to do something to take a look at that chrome? And then the very last one listed there is nickel. Have you guys ever seen this data before? Presented this way. It, it's, it's kind of, it, I think it's very interesting. Um, then you look at the top five facilities for the top five RECI scores. So what facilities 
what are the top five facilities that have the highest risk, environmental risk for the communities they're in? And the first one there is 3P. Uh, and then we've got Harcross, Spirit, SPX, and Coffeeville Resources. When you look at our, our general area here, um, our area in Kansas, specifically South Central Kansas, uh, that's a map that kind of points everything out. Okay, so with that, um, I, I wanted to give you something to think about for the future. Do we want to look at anything beyond TCE? Um, we are funded under a pollution prevention grant uh, to do um, these TCE roundtables. They're um, obviously, um, this isn't a huge audience that we're necessarily serving, but we really want to keep you posted on what's going on under TOSCA. We want to encourage you to, to comment uh, to EPA when the comment periods are open. And you know, if we can find any of these new types of alternatives, um, we want to get that information out to you as soon as possible because folks sitting in this room are really, you know, are possibly going to be um, very much impacted by any new regulations on uh, TCE. And I know you all would like to get rid of it if you had a viable, uh, a viable option. So this is also just looking at some other things that we may want to look at in the future from a pollution prevention aspect. Yes. Yes, we transitioned to chrome. Oh, they're over chrome. Or, how much they use, how much I think, isn't that the RACI scores? <coughs> Is that the RACI? I believe that's the RACI scores. I, yeah. What did I say here? Uh, Beach Textron, Aviation East, Cessna. Yeah, that is their RISI score. I apologize. So where the score is highest, that's the highest risk. So yeah, not the chrome, but it is, it is, you know, obviously chrome is the biggest factor in elevating the RISI score. Yes. So thank you, Allison. So three P's is 1.6 million. Chrome and TCE. If you look at that, those <laughs> earlier. Um, so I, I know it's hard to necessarily get your brain around this. Um, but if we take a look at um, this slide, see if I can get my mouse to come over here and work. Then um, at the very top, the biggest contributor there it, um, is chromium, and it, it um, it's three P processing, and that's what, that is what is making their score so high is the amount of releases that they're reporting on TRI. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in 2017, chromium is responsible for the highest RISI scores. Ethylene oxide, it, like I said, it's only coming from one source. Okay. Well, with that, I just want to um, I want to turn it over to Allison. But I did not properly introduce Allison earlier when we were doing some introductions. So Allison. Allison was an intern with us in 2018 in a food processing manufacturer. She's uh, got her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and we hired her when she graduated last December. And she has been working on our pollution prevention intern program. So Allison, um, and she's located in Kansas City. And um, I asked her just to say a few things about our intern program from this year because she's just done all the QA on the 
on the data and updated everything. So this, this is just one more resource we wanted to highlight because we are looking for host companies right now for our interns for next year. So basically we select upper level and graduate engineering and physical science, science students. We train them in pollution prevention techniques and with some equipment we have available. And we send them out to work on source reduction projects. So they can look into toxins, toxics reduction for you, um, whether that's replacements or ways to use less. They also commonly look into energy reduction, water reduction, so any of those projects that you've been wanting to look into and you might like to have an extra person to work on that for the summer, we are looking to recruit right now. So that is also on those papers that you have. If you want to put your contact information, if you want to hear more about this, we have some postcards back here if you want to pick, pick one up or Nancy and I also could answer some questions about that. Um, they are typically 10 week placements. And again, those are summer internships. So. Yeah, anything to add? Nope, I don't think okay. so. Um, um, we do have a circuit writer. I know Globe has used our circuit writer before. That's a, they just do a brief visit. Uh, and, um, and those are at no cost to the industry. But they are very focused just on pollution prevention. These are not interns that we have doing, um, you know, manual updates or permitting, any regulatory um, we want them actually be looking at source reduction opportunities for you, whether that's energy, water, or chemical. But in this case, we're really focused on any toxic chemicals. We're doing a lot of chemical inventorying right now uh, for industries because um, <clears throat> EPA has uh, three national emphasis areas. And <clears throat> as you probably know, they often come out with voluntary um, programs for their national emphasis areas because then they are going to follow them up with regulations. And so their three national emphasis areas are the areas that we're mainly working in. And one is, um, is toxics reduction in industry. Another is food uh, manufacturing and um, processing. And then the third one is uh, Tosca chemical uh, targeted Tosca chemical reduction and community um, reduction of community impacts. So a lot of things that large businesses do uh, to reduce toxics obviously has a huge community impact. We've got, because we've got not just your employees, but we've also got uh, the people in your community living around your facilities in the city. So I think that's probably about it. We've got um, almost 80 case studies um, from companies we've worked with on our website. So thanks, Allison. And I really appreciate all your technical assistance today. This is a part where we are going to sign off the webinar. And we'll ask that if you're a regulator, if you could um, leave the meeting, that would be great. So we'll um, thank you for joining us on the webinar today.